Welcome to Crisis What Crisis, the podcast where we aim to guide you towards a more resilient approach to life and whatever it might throw at you. I'm Andy Coulson, and on this podcast, you'll hear from the embattled, shamed, courageous, ruined, damaged, resilient, unlucky, and lucky survivors of crisis. Their stories, I hope you'll agree, are as useful as they are compelling. My guest today is James Timpson, OBE, the enormously successful businessman whose family-run company boasts over 2,000 Timpsons, Snappy Snaps, and other high street brands up and down the country. In this conversation, you'll hear how James's decision during lockdown to send all of his staff home on full pay almost lost him everything. As he said, half of me thought, this is a business experiment to see if we can survive. The other half thought, if we're going to go down, we'll go down in style, sticking to our values. You'll also hear about his loving but somewhat unconventional upbringing in a home that over the years was a refuge to some 90 foster children, an environment, he says, that could go from calm to chaos in a matter of seconds. It's clear that this early exposure to crisis in its rawest form is where that culture of kindness and the firm belief that everyone should be treated the same was firmly embedded in James. It also led to his other great passion in life, the rehabilitation of ex-offenders. James is the chairman of the Prison Reform Trust, uh, but he also walks the talk in his business life. Timpson's programme of recruiting former prisoners is one of Britain's most progressive and successful re-employment initiatives. But as James says, it's only when he sees a reformed ex-offender become the CEO of a well-known public company that he will really begin to believe that we are truly changing our attitude towards criminal justice. So this conversation is, I think, an inspiring one, and I think demonstrates how a little kindness and generosity of spirit towards those in crisis can go a very, very long way. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. James Timpson, welcome to Crisis What Crisis. How are you? I'm good, thank you. All good. Thanks no so much. Today, unfortunately, so oh, far. very good, very good. Pleased to hear it. Thanks so much for joining us, um, James. If I may, I'd like to start right at the beginning, if that's okay, with your um, upbringing, because although it was, as you've described it, a very loving, very privileged childhood, you also grew up um, around crisis, because your home was a crisis refuge. Really, um, your amazing mother. Uh, Alex was a was a truly remarkable woman, a dedicated, prolific foster parent who, with your dad, cared for over ninety children. Um, and she was also a, 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 a very dedicated campaigner for children's rights. Awarded an MBE, in fact, for her amazing work. Tell t- tell us a bit about life at home as a child, James. About what that upbringing taught you about crisis. When you so let me give you a bit of background. Um, when I was eight years old, my parents started fostering kids, and in in those days, fostering was very different because they basically these kids came came to you for a maximum of six months, and then they then they went away. So, from the age of eight, they'd wake up in the morning, go down for breakfast, go into school, and these kids have arrived overnight, and they're sitting around the breakfast table wearing my clothes and part of the family. And they were very different from, from the friends that I'd have from school because a lot of these kids had never really been to school. They're, I mean, they knew far more swear words than I knew. They were quite violent, but also very loving. They were um, people who had never seen half the things I'd seen. I mean, they'd never been on an aeroplane, they'd never been on a holiday, they'd never been to a zoo. They'd never done the things that most of us take for granted. And... It was like a sort of a permanent state of chaos hmm. because they had no structure in their lives. They didn't really know how to conduct themselves in anything from eating. You know, some of them never used knife and forks. It was just the fighting, the rowing. It, the, the level of noise just ramped up dramatically when foster children arrived. And in some ways, I was fortunate because I got to see on the inside of what it's like to have these complex lives that these people have but also that they were always younger than me. And I think if, they, if, the, if the foster children had come in who were always older than us, it would have been, very, it would have been really different. But my mum specialised in having lots of babies. So we had lots of little babies around the place. Um, we actually had, the only older kids we had were Down syndrome kids who used to come to us for respite care with the parents who used to love the Downs um, kids coming to stay right. with us. 
Um, but I would say it was a combination of living, living in a bit of a war zone, living in the most loving, caring environment. And you go from calm to chaos in seconds. Because these moments would, the chaotic moments would just come presumably out of a blue sky almost because you're dealing with kids that were not in control of their emotions that had had traumatic lives, uh, I suspect, in many cases. I mean, how did you, how did you as, a, as, a, as, a, as a child kind of ha- handle that? Are there any particular uh, uh, moments that sort of stick in, stick in your mind that, that, that kind of bring that to life? I've got so many. Um, one of the reasons why I get really stressed about going to airports on time now is because we had a number of cases where the foster children, because they were scared of going on an aeroplane for the first time, would make lots of reasons why they couldn't go on holiday or they were late or they would go and hide. The worst one was we were going to America for a big, holiday, big family holiday. We'd never been to America before. And we had um, a foster child called Andrew coming with us. And he just did a runner about half an hour before we meant to leave for the airport. And, you know, the chaos that creates... We've lost a child. They're meant to be going on holiday with us. The whole thing was... So, so examples like that where it just goes from... You know, when everyone's really looking forward to something, just there's, there's something... There's a thing around attachment disorder and this, this inability to, in, in, inability of traumatised people to have a nice, kind, happy, normal environment around them. Hmm. And, and, and then you just want to help them. So let me give you another one. We had... Um, we had, in fact, it was another boy, very charismatic, but very challenging boy. He just smashed everything up all the time. He killed the cat. Um, smashed he killed, the cars up, he, he killed, killed cat. your cat. Yeah, it, it, it just died in his in his care. He obviously strangled it. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, and it's a combination of <laughs> you know you meant to be doing your homework and then you got a dead cat. I mean, how are you? You're eight when this when the fostering started. But you are, you, you, as I explained earlier, 90 children. The fostering went on for, for a very long time. How do you remember sort of um, understanding it, I suppose, and, and accepting it? Because although, I'm, you know, your, your, your parents obviously did the most amazing job of explaining, you know, what fostering was, what it was all about, why you were doing it. It's still a very difficult thing to comprehend, even as a, as you know, even as a teenager, uh, let alone as an eight-year-old. How did you, what do you remember about how your parents kind of, it, it, what, how they created that environment that allowed you to have this loving, you know, wonderful childhood in the same environment as all this chaos? We were very loved. And we also knew that the foster children at some point would go. And some you didn't want to go because they were great fun and, you know, they were really nice to have around. Others, you were just counting down the days and hours until they went because their behaviour was just so challenging. Um, but it was, it was normal because that's what we're used to. But when I look back on it now, bringing people into your home, often very damaged, been abused, um, malnourished, uneducated it was it's a risk it is a, it is a real risk because you're exposing your family to risks that most families don't have but it also gives you an opportunity to see life in a completely different way and to know that there are certain things you can do to help these kids so in, in, in some way probably one of the things why I'm a bit of a salesperson is because you have to sell yourself to these kids so they, so they don't kick off when you're having to look after them there's right. ways of managing complex people so they trust you and they they stay calm and so that, and that was something you were doing as a effectively as a child you were learning that skill as a child really yeah you have to sell yourself to get to get people behaving in the way you want to make it to make life easier for you yeah yeah and to av- and to avoid the real moments of drama because when but it that, kicks off it really kicks off yeah but I'm just I'm I'm interested in how your parents kind of explained it to you because you're the most loving child in the world. You just given the example of your cat being killed could cause you as a as a as a as a, as a child to that's a deeply it could be a deeply upsetting moment in a child in a child's life. Your parents obviously did the most amazing job of explaining the context and the and the kind of reasons why these things were happening. Um, 
or, or maybe maybe you kind of worked it out with your siblings and it was just it's, it's just it's just f- fascinating that uh, that you were able to uh, navigate it I suppose I mean we were young people too so we're not you know mm. at that age you're not sophisticated you don't understand these things yeah but my parents are always very true to their word in you know my dad took my brother and I to the football my sister went horse riding all those sort of things. So we did get the one-on-one time with our parents, but but then you get the the full-on, the you know the this the normal family routine we all have, the meals around the table and all that sort of stuff, watching TV at night and stuff. And that was that that was when we we're in it all together. But it was there was a very clear distinction, and we knew that we were our parents' children, and we also knew that my parents were trying to help these kids and their families, and we had a role in that. Um, but my parents, certainly my mother, me, you know, my dad was out working most of the time, but it was my mum's job in her life to try and help these kids. And we had a, a small part to play in it. Yeah. I mean, you're being exposed to the sort of tough side of life at home, but uh, as, as I understand it, your mum also would uh, would visit prisons. And obviously we'll talk about your work in that world uh, in, more, in more detail a little bit later. So you have children babies that that that, that she was fostering who she would take to prison so that they could get some time with their mother uh, who would obviously was in was inside and you'd go with her and sort of sit in the car outside while all this was happening I mean that is a very um you know that's a very sort of you know that's a window into a very kind of brutal grown-up world isn't it um what do you what do you remember about those kind of moments and uh, and the impact that it had when you have a baby going into care, it's normally, because, well, in our case, maybe things change now, but when we were doing this, is because their mums had gone to prison. And normally it was like a sort of happened in the middle of the night, put on remand, wouldn't be released, so the kids would be taken into care. And because we lived in a big house in the middle of nowhere, it was a safe place for these babies to go because no one knew where they were. Because often you'd have people who would basically try and get the babies back and mm. husbands, boyfriends and so on. So it could be pretty spicy. And so when everything sort of settled down, my mum, once or twice a week, used to go to Style Prison, which is a women's prison near Manchester Airport, not far from where we used to live. And we used to go there. She had a Peugeot 505 um, estate, remember it now, no seatbelts in those days. And she used to drive to Style Prison. The car park is exactly the same today as it was then. And we used, to what, we used to listen to ABBA cassettes played in the car, what felt like for hours and hours, probably we were, I was fighting with my siblings at the time in the car, probably, we got bored. And I was always fascinated what went on over that wall. So my mum would go over with this baby and then she'd come back just telling us what happened. It was a good visit. Um, she was very interested in the connection between the mum and the baby. And sometimes it wasn't really that sort of connection. And others, it was just terribly sad. And it always fascinated me what went on the other side of the wall. What, why, why was someone kept there and they couldn't be with their children? What had they done wrong that's so bad? that they can't be there to read their kids a story at night. And I just felt it was sort of wrong. I didn't understand mm. all the complexities in it. And I just found it fascinating. So, you know, we're modern parenting. You often hear, you know, that it's, it's all about actually protecting your, your children from, you know, that more brutal side of life, particularly when they're, you know, when they're, when, when, when they're young. Your life seems to be the uh, very clear demonstration that the, that the opposite has to be right, because all of these experiences, we've touched on them only briefly, but these experiences obviously have kind of fueled you and your adult life in a, in a way that's just very clear and, and remarkable. The things that you now decide to business included, focus your mind and effort, all seems to come from those childhood experiences or am I just being overly simplistic? Is it more, is it more, is it more nuanced than that? I think, I think it's a combination of the fact that, you know, my, my, you know, a certain amount of our personalities are set, aren't they? But the, I just, I just get really angry and in a positive way, the fact that I feel people don't get the chance in life they should do. I just think it's unfair. And I think it's unfair that mistakes people make when they are young or in their life, um, shouldn't define them, and I don't. And I, I just have it in my body that no one's more important than anybody else, and everyone should be treated as an equal. And it just really pisses me off when people aren't. And so that's my sort of 
that's it that, that's my engine going all the time i just i just feel these things are wrong and so the way i run the business and the way i get involved in other things is sort of driven by that and a lot of that does go back to to my mother and fostering the fact that these young you know, these young kids and babies who came to live with us were treated as an equal with us you know we we knew we were our parents children but they were treated as an equal they ate the same food they wore the same clothes they came on holiday with us mm. um they went to private school and my parents paid for foster children to go to private school really you know, there's, no, there's no difference and you know whilst we we all have um different personalities and different um ways we go about living our lives we're all equal How, you you obviously then hold to the view that there is value in showing you know young people our kids that side of life i mean have you done the same out of interest i mean your 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 work is so clear and so fundamental to your life that i guess your kids just sort of see it every day uh that attitude that you've just explained to us but do you do you, do you think you know more more generally that we don't do enough to have these kind of conversations earlier in people's lives if you like prison is a very good example right it's a grown-up adult conversation uh, and is almost to be kind of s- slightly pushed to one side. We don't really want to have that conversation, do we, in schools or or or, or, or in a sort of younger context? I mean, the, it's much easier to go through life thinking that everyone's like you. That um, you know, in my case, you know, privileged upbringing, you know, financially secure. Um, that's the way it is. But it, but that's not real. And I think as as a parent, we try to. We, we, my uh, machine and, and I, we have three kids, they're all sort of nearly grown up now. Um, but you're just signposting all the time about what life is really like for people and the fact that they, that they should not judge people on their past or what they look like or where they live or, or what they say. Um, so let me, let, me, let me give you one example. Neve, our daughter, is in her second year at Durham University now. And when she went up there for her sort of interview day or whatever it is, you know, you have to go and check things out. Um, her meeting, her appointment wasn't until three o'clock, but we got there at 11 o'clock. So I thought, great, there's a prison in Durham, city centre. So let's go there. So I phoned up the governor. So listen, I know it's short notice, but my daughter, my wife and I would like to come and have a look around the prison. You know, explain how I'm involved with prisons. And then half an hour later, we were walking on the wings with our 18 year old daughter, um, talking to prisoners, talking to officers. Um, we were in the healthcare unit and you know, it's real. You know, when you, you know, in, in, in Durham, it's a really good example because um, it's right in the middle of the city centre. So students are walking past the gate all the time. But maybe they should know what goes on the other side of the gate too, because it's, it's real. It's remarkable. Um, James, your, your, your mum died six years ago, I think I'm right in saying. Um, you set up a trust in her name, which continues to do, um, you know, amazing work for looked after children. Um, I'm sure her loss is still deeply felt by uh, by all of you, especially your dad. Um, tell me a little bit more about that trust and and uh, and, and the work that it and the work that it does. So we always go back 15 years in the business. We used to basically have a charity of the year, and it was it basically went down to a vote, and it was basically whoever gave the best presentation got the money for the year, NSPCC, child line, that kind of thing. Because we're a national business, we, we, we need to have a charity that covers all of our colleagues and all of our shops. So, and then, and then we started to do lots of work with after, charity called After Adoption. So we did that for about four or five years. And then when my mum died, I thought, you know what, let's use this as an opportunity to really focus on giving money to the things that she wanted us to give money to if she was still alive. So we set up the Alex Simpson Trust, and I think our sort of overall goal is to help children shine. So basically, we focus on fostering adoption because that's what we know about. And my dad is really interested in attachment disorder, which is what a lot of kids who go through the care system have, where um, you basically struggle, often struggle in life to film to to, to 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 have trusting, loving relationships with people, pets, colleagues, loved ones, and um, it's. Well, one, and one of the things we've always been interested in is, is, is how teachers, when, when they know about attachment, in the same way knowing about autism or dyslexia, they're much more understanding and they can help the kids. It's not because they're thick, it's because they've got these issues. And uh, attachment is far more common than, you know. So we did a whole work on attachment. And then also we knew that, I mean, over the years, we were always paying for foster families or even uh, parents who've taken the kids on and adopted our foster children. 
couldn't really afford to go on holiday, so we were always paying for holidays and stuff. So we said, well, why don't we buy some holiday homes so foster parents can go on holiday with their foster kids? Because a lot of the time, they've never been on holiday to you know, the seaside and so on. So we bought some holiday homes and we do that and we help fund work around that, that kind of area. So um, you know, every three months, my dad and myself and a couple of colleagues meet to work out who we're going to give money to. You know, we have our list and so on. And we always come down, we always decide, what would my mum have done? Would she said yes to that, no to that? And yeah. because she was such a, a pushover and a soft touch on these sort of things, virtually always yes. But, uh, right, okay. So that's what we do. So, no, it's been that's great. And, and also, I know it's going, to, it's going to carry on. The, of course, where the, where the kind of um, children in care looked after kids and your prison reform work connect is that horribly depressing you know, num- number of kids who come out of care and end up in prison. Uh, the link between those two worlds is, or the bridge between those two worlds is, 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 is real. Where in your uh, uh, view do we target, um, you know, the, the, the solution to that? I know employment in terms of um, uh, ex-offenders is, is your number one priority. But for those kids in care who are immediately coming out of care and immediately then, then treated um, as an adult, we had Lem Cisse uh, on the podcast some time ago. I don't know if you know Lem, an amazing man who's written an amazing book about his story. I mean, it's just a, a terribly sad, but at the same time, incredibly uplifting story of a, of a lad who comes out of care and is immediately, the thing that struck me was that he was just immediately, the switch of support was just flipped and he was on his own as an adult looking for a flat without a job, just and only ever having really been in, well, certainly for the you know preceding years been in, been in care so what's your view james in how we start to approach that that challenge um but lems i mean i've read the book it's incredible in fact one of the rooms in our training center is named after him because he was <laughs> so fired by way what, what what you know his life is incredible yeah and um, i'm going to take you one area which is schools i think schools have got a lot to do to help people who come from the care background because then the kids are more challenging by nature. They are just more challenging. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Greg's as in sausage roll, Greg's, they run breakfast clubs around the country in schools and they're brilliant. It's such a simple concept. So we, we work with a school in Winsford where in Cheshire, where a lot of the foster kids that, that we had went, um, came from um, Winsford. And I think we paid three grand a year and they do free breakfast for kids who want to come in there and parents come and help out. And for lots of these kids, it's the first time they've ever had breakfast, properly breakfast, the, the routine because their parents aren't in, they're working night shifts or they're just not out of, you know, they just don't get out of bed. So I think the structure of a school day is very important, but also the teachers being aware of the challenges these kids have. And I'll come back to what you are saying, Andy, about attachment disorder, about understanding that, these kids, when they when they kick off because they don't get their own way, when they um, when they're put in a position where they fear they're going to fail, they run away or they or they fight. It's not because they're bad kids; it's just because they're damaged. And it's about how we recognise that they're damaged and what we can do to help them. And actually, the support networks for um, autism, dyslexia, even attachment are becoming far more established, and it does make a big difference to kids. So, I would say for for specifically care leavers schools when they understand the issues can do a huge amount of work and the school we work with in Winsford we've been working with them for many years um, the impact they have on uh, care leavers lives is, is fantastic it may, really makes a difference because they're on it they know what they're doing they really care but the school's responsibility ends with the with the, with the child you know in, in, invariably leaving school so so how do we catch them at that point? Because that presumably is when the risks really start to really start to kick in. So once once the once the kind of support of school has gone uh, and the support of the care system has gone, where where do you think we should target? How do we how do we how do we how do we kind of keep a grip on on, on these kids at that stage? Well, the um, in fact, you should, you should ask my brother this one of these questions, because he was when he was children's minister, he, they managed he managed to get through a bill that's uh, foster children are supported up the age of 21 now rather than just 18 which I think that's a big difference mm. but you're right the danger zone is leaving school to getting to I would say 24 25 especially mm. the, the the young men because as an employer we struggled recruiting 
men under the age of 24. They're just not mature enough. They don't stick with things. Their hormones are all over the place. So I do think it is a massive problem. And one of the, you know, there, there are three elements that they need in their life is somewhere to live, someone to love them, and a job. And you know, we're, as a business, you know, the thing that we can do is the job part. But it is, a lot of it is down to connections and the ability to, to use those connections to just get a job doing anything. But, you know, I think for, 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 for lots of us, hardly any of the foster children who, who came to us went to university. Even now, I, just, I don't know what the stats are, but I suspect very few care leavers go to university. And they drift around until they find those th- three elements of their life, somewhere to live, somewhere to look out for them, and a, and, and a job. Um, but the st- the, I think it's something like a third of people in prison have been in the care system. So the easy alternative for them is to have a life of crime. It's, you know, they, they get identity, they join gangs and gangs are the first, you know, they, they give them that, that element of big part of something. They, they, they feel successful. Whereas yeah. in lots of other jobs, they don't feel successful. So I think it comes down to um, helping them get, get, helping them, holding on to them as long as you can until they m- mature enough to get a job. And if they're lucky enough to find a great partner, that makes a big difference too. Okay, let's um, let, let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the day job. You run Timpsons, uh, the brilliant family business we all know, um, the business that was founded by your great great grandfather. I think I'm right yeah. in saying one of the many um, remarkable things about Timpsons is that the business essentially has the same ethos as it did when it was founded in 1865. I mean, it is essentially the same. Um, if you don't mind, James, you've told the story a thousand times, I'm sure, but I'd love to hear it from you directly. Just tell us the story of that ethos and how has it kind of survived through these generations to you now as, as, as the chief exec? Well, we're a family business and that makes things different because there's always been a Timpson running the business. So there's that sort of consistency of a family. And what's... I don't know whether it's by luck or judgment or the fact that we're just maybe commercial people. I'll come back to that one in, in a minute. That it's much nicer running a business where you're where there is a culture of kindness. It's much more interesting to run a business where people stay for a long time, where people enjoy working in the business. And it comes back to this point at the end. I believe the most commercially successful way to run an organization is not to be a shit bag, but to be kind. And to be kind, you don't need to be a pushover. You need to be someone who listens, knows their people, looks after them when they've got a problem, treats them as an equal. And when you can treat them and spoil them with things, you should do it. They're part of your family. And a true family business isn't people who have the surname of the founder. It's everybody who works in in that business, whether they've just joined or been there for 45 years. A family business is where everybody is treated as part of the family. So my great, great grandfather, when he first started the business, um, I'd love to have met him actually. It would have been fascinating to know what he's really like. I sort of read bits, you know, family stories and letters and mm. so on. Mm. But it was my great grandfather who really grew the business from 19, um, 1929 to 1960. He was the one that really embedded this culture of kindness. And the fact that you know, we employ people from all walks of life, but everybody's treated the same. And that stemmed from your great grandfather on the, the sort of a, arriving in Manchester to start the business and being penniless and, and getting a leg up, basically. Someone, someone sort of helped him out and he made the decision at that point that this would be a business that would, that would give back. Yeah. So the, the, the story goes, and, and uh, you know, I, I don't know this is 100% true, but this is what's been written down in the family journals. My great great grandfather, who founded the business, when he was 14, he was sent to Manchester from his little village, farming village in, near Kettering, um, to go and live with his uncle because of lots of jobs in Manchester at the time. And the, the flag uh, business in their village, they used to make lots of flags for people. In, in battles, wasn't doing very well. So anyway, he went to Manchester, but he'd never been on a train before, so he got on the wrong train and ended up at the station in Sheffield 
sleeping overnight on the platform, not knowing what to do because he didn't have any money. And he met this guy who gave him the money to get to Manchester. And he always said, finally, that person's helped me out. So it's my job to help others. So that's something that I think is, you know, is a really good story, but it also signifies that we all benefit in life if we help others. You said earlier that it is easier for you because it's a family business, but the, you know, the business world is littered with uh, family businesses that, that have not managed to hang on to that ethos and lose it. In fact, it, I would say it's probably more usual that, that, that family businesses kind of fall apart for that reason rather than, rather than find their way through. We know plenty uh, of businesses that have ended in exactly that situation. So what is it about the, the you know, the Timpsons that you've, I mean, I think we know the answer, don't we? Because we're, you've described your childhood. So we certainly, know, we certainly know how it bridged from one generation to yours. But clearly, this is something that runs, that runs through your family in a very powerful way. I think yeah, it's about the values, isn't it? And the values you have in your life is, is you know, if it works in your life, why doesn't it work? It should work in your family too. And you know, those are the values that we talk about a lot. I think it helps that... My dad, so my grandfather actually sold the business because there was a big fallout of the family and my, and my dad bought it back. So the shareholding used to be very dispersed and now it's not, it's not at all, which makes a difference. Um, but I also think what, what helps for us is we're not really financially driven. Yeah, the business is financially very successful and we have a very nice lifestyle, but that's not our drive. Our drive is to have a really good business that we're really proud of. And I think that has meant that we can run it in the way we want and we get that longevity rather than... You know, I, I see these businesses all the time where they're just bleeding it. They're taking every bit of cash out of the business they can. Um, and that's not helpful for long-term success of the business. We'll be right back after this. As regular listeners know, Crisis What Crisis is brought to you with a little help from Mindstream, a personal well-being music company designed to create those karma moments in our hectic lives. Mindstream can really help put you back on track and guide you towards the mindfulness that we all need to function more effectively. And I can tell you from personal experience that it really works. Mindstream music is cleverly designed to help regulate your body's response to stressful situations by slowing your heartbeat and guiding you towards that more calmer state. They also have playlists to stimulate your brain, helping to keep you focused and engaged for longer periods of time. Getting your mindset right is the absolute key when you're navigating a crisis or if you're just struggling with day-to-day pressures. You'll find them at mindstream.com. That's mind with a Y. Uh, They're also on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, wherever you download your music from. So take back some control and consider making a Mindstream playlist one of your crisis cures. I don't think you'll regret it. And now back to James Timpson. Well, values uh, are tested in the difficult times, obviously. And you've had some difficult times as a business. I'm sure there have been some that we maybe have read about, some that we haven't. But you give, us a, give us a feel, um, James, for, and if you're comfortable doing so, tell us about one of those difficult moments when the values are being tested uh, and you stay the course. Okay, let's, so let's talk about COVID. So, and I think one of the things that um, the way I react to difficult situations is I'm a lot calmer than I am normally when it's not difficult. And I don't know whether that's because of my personality or the, you know, what I was brought up with this sort of chaotic situation with foster children in the house, but I, I, I sort of become quite calm in a crisis. Um, so let's take COVID. Um, the business was flying before COVID. Everything was going great. I've just done six months of road shows around the country, talking to colleagues about the culture and all the new things we're doing and growing the business and extra colleague benefits and so on. And then Within three weeks, all my shops were shut. Now, I had in my head that we were going to be closed for, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks, something like that. We had lots of money in the bank. We had no borrowings. You know, we run the business very conservatively. So I, I wrote a letter to all of our colleagues to say, you're going to have to go home now. I'm going to guarantee you 100% of your salary. Everything else will continue as normal. And as long as we're kind to each other, we'll come through this Okay. So after three weeks, I'd lost four million quid. And I thought, okay, this is going to get worse. And I thought, well, then, and, then, and then the rent was due on all, with all of our 
landlords. Obviously, we've got you know, we've got two thousand one hundred shops, so we've got lots of landlords. And w- one of my finance colleagues said, uh, "What do you want to do about the rents because they're going out next week?" He said, "We pay all of our rents. We've signed agreements. We we we, we stick by everything we sign in the good times and the bad." And so half of me thought, "Well." This is a bit of a bit of a, a business experiment to see whether we can survive. And the other one was, well, if we're going to go down, we might as well go down in style and stick to our values. So, whilst we made redundancies, which was bloody difficult, um, I paid everyone all the way through. We paid all of our suppliers, and in fact, we went from I think we, I think we went from something like nineteen point seven million in the bank our high, the day COVID, we shut the shops to seventy four grand. That was our lowest point, so we never actually went overdrawn. But it was just a case of what do we do? This is unprecedented. So I was reading the news all the time, trying to communicate, sending daily videos out to everybody about what was going on, all the things we're trying to do. Um, but you have to stick to your values. Otherwise, I don't think you really can look everyone in the face afterwards. Was there a point, though, on that where you were on that sort of you know road that you just described where you thought that actually... I, I, we, I think we're going to lose all this. Oh, yeah. I, on day three into lockdown, there were about four of us in the office, and we were all you know, about 20 feet apart. No one would, you, know, you, you, you were touching handles with your elbows in the, at, at that time. And when I was, walked out of the office to go home, it was a really sunny day, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to have to take a photo of it. So I actually took a video of my office, thinking I'm, never going, to, I'm probably never, never going to go back here again. I thought we were done. So we, were completely, you know, we are a high fixed cost, high margin business that has no online capability, capability at all. And if people don't go to work or don't go on holiday or don't go to school, they don't need us. So we were, we, we were sort of the worst business to have in COVID. You, you probably couldn't get a worse one than us. Um, so, yeah, so we just, we, we made it through. Um, and would I have done anything differently? Not many things, actually. Um, we, were, we, we did the right things by our values. We made a number of redundancies, which was horrendous, but we realised in retrospect we, had too many, we probably had too many people. So it's made the business probably fitter to cope with the choppy waters ahead we're in now. But um, I actually think as a leader, being tested like that, and you know, we, had, we had colleagues die of COVID, so you know, I'm... I don't say this with any satisfaction, but I'm pleased I was tested. I felt, you know, I'm 50 years old now, so I was 48 when that happened. And I think to be tested as a leader in a time of crisis is, it, is a good thing because it, if you know you can cope with that, you can cope with anything. What was your, the, you know, sticking to the values aside, what is the sort of James Timpson crisis management approach? How were you getting through the days? Very small a number of people around you, presumably. Tight decision-making fast decision making i assume i mean how are you how are you sort of managing the day just give us a flavor of the approach that you take okay so up early because i couldn't sleep um look on the news finding anything positive about covid i could i could find so we had um three strategies the first one was my senior team communication wise every morning nine o'clock we had a um it was actually before we, we, we started doing zoom it was a conference call of my probably top 15 leaders from every different part of the business. On a call, we'd have a COVID update of how many colleagues got COVID from our HR director. And then everyone would go through what they're doing in their business, what's happening, what's happening. And it was all about how are colleagues, how are costs, how can we save money? So we'd have that call every morning. It was like, then it would be obviously during the day, then you have your various jobs to do from there. Then I'd do a daily video to colleagues, for the whole business of WhatsApp to all, all the colleagues just, update where we were with the business, being really honest with everybody, telling them how much money we have in the bank today, how much money we lost the previous week, that we're paying everybody, that this is what we're doing, uh, that we're making redundancies and so on. Um, and then it would be, uh, basically, because the only income we could get was from the government, from furlough, from grants and so on, we got a small team together of our finance colleagues to say, right, we are now the income team from the government. We need to find every way that we can get these furlough payments in fast. We do it all absolutely by the book, but we get everything in we can. So that's basically what we did. We became in survival mode, get the money in. And it's only when you 
see your sales fall to the floor? Do you really realize what your costs are, what you're paying for? Mm-hmm. So I go, so every day, every invoice that came through, I and mean, I haven't seen an invoice for years in the business, um, but every day we see every invoice go through. Why are we paying for that? Water coolers in shops. We don't need water coolers. We don't need this. We don't need that. Why are we paying for this? We've got vans there. We're not, we're not using. Sell those cars. Sell those trucks. We had some properties. It's when everybody wanted to live in the countryside. So we had a couple of um, houses in the countryside. Sell them. Just get any money in. So it basically became that kind of um, financial management. Um, but also stru- trying to stay calm in front of my colleagues because you know, they could see what was happening. They, you know, they, they, they could see what was happening. And then, and then the game became get the shops open as soon as we can. And we were lucky because lawn, laundrettes and dry cleaning went on the list of essential retailers that could open. And so we spoke to supermarkets, where our shops were in supermarkets, and said, listen, yeah, we can do this now. Uh, so can we open the Timpson shops? We, we weren't allowed to open our Snappy Snaps or Max Spearman shops, but we could open the Timpson shops and the Johnson's and Cleaner shops. So these then we had like a positive story, even though the sales were like 70% down, it's, we, we could start training again. And then we brought all the colleagues back. So you do, everyone would do two days a week to get back in the swing of things. Um, and then we, we had to overcome two colleagues passing away, both of whom I, I, I knew very well. So that was a real, that, that was a very difficult time for everybody. Um, and we just sort of, then we got more shops open and we weren't losing as much money and the grants started coming in and we could sort of see light at the end of the tunnel. And it actually became quite fun then because you felt you were sort of battling against everything to, to save mm. the business. Mm. Those uh, colleagues' deaths aside, um... What is the when, when you now look back at that period? What was the darkest moment? Feeling helpless. I felt it was un, you know, what I felt was I was helpless, and I felt it was unfair. And it was unfair because other businesses were having the time of their lives, even yes. though you know difficult and masks everywhere and COVID issues. But the government were basically giving a free pass to certain about our competitors to make more money than it ever made before. Um, all your competition goes. And I just felt it was unfair. And, you know, you know, whilst I, you know, I've got friends who are in that position who had an amazing run, you know, and they were, you know, whilst they found it stressful, you know, how do you find, how do you find extra colleagues and supply chain issues and so on? Um, it's a big difference making money and losing money when you don't think it's your fault. Yeah. Were you taking the stresses home or have you always been able to sort of separate them? I think if you spoke to my kids and my wife, it was stressful. You don't sleep, you're a bit edgy, you know, even when you're having dinner and the phone's going, fine, you leave dinner and answer the call because this could be the the next brick to hit you Mm. in the head or the next opportunity to get you out of jail. And it was a combination of, you're just just wired, you're on it. You know, you're yeah. trying. You, you, you're trying to sort of be that swan that's gliding across the lake, but actually paddling like mad underneath. And you know, in these dark moments, there's humour as well. Um, Parish, my finance director, you know, we've, we've worked together for 18 years, and he's, he's fantastic. And um, you know, we you know, we sort of laughed about you know how 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 easy it is to lose so much money. You know, when we tried so long to make little bits of money all the time, just it all to go out the door in a matter of weeks is uh, pretty um, pretty hard to see. I mean, I say, did you take the stresses home? Of course, you were at home, like the rest of us. So then I had any excuse to go to the office. It's actually wonderful because there's no traffic. I mean, for those of your listeners who live anywhere near Manchester, you know, we're in Withenshaw. Traffic's horrendous in the morning, driving straight in. And there was a core team of six of us, uh, Gail doing the payroll, Goy, our HR colleague, and some finance colleagues. And it became a sort of a little band of brothers. Mm. And we, you know, we were there. We were fighting to keep the doors open, and um, it actually, it actually became a weirdly enjoyable process of saving the business. But I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I was the best father or, or husband in that time, just because I wasn't present, sure. mentally present. Yeah. Um, your brother Edward, of course, is a politician, a former minister. Uh, we, we mentioned him briefly earlier. Uh, we campaigned together, in fact, in the 2010 election uh, in the famous Crew and Nantwich by election. Uh, you were never tempted by politics. At least I'm assuming you've never been tempted by politics. No, I just, run my just, just not for you. No, I'm not a political person. I don't feel, you know, the, 
I, I love running businesses and organizations. I don't want to run a country, but I find it bloody frustrating sometimes when policies don't go, you know, on, on the way I feel they should be. But um, no, I've never wanted to get involved. I mean, I don't like the idea of um, having to having to play to someone else's tune and say things I don't necessarily believe in. I yeah. find that very difficult. So you're not political, uh, but you have, uh, you know, outside of that very demanding job that you've just described, fully immersed yourself uh, in one of the most complicated, frustrating, dysfunctional areas of public policy in criminal justice. You're the chairman of the Prison Reform Trust, among uh, many other uh, uh, roles that you have in this world, um, where you do some some brilliant work, much of it focused on getting those with prison experience, as we now put it, uh, back into work. Uh, and that's the fundamental belief that you have. I mean, you, you, you touched on this earlier in a younger context, but it holds for all uh, 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 ex-prisoners that by providing that route from prison to work, we will reduce the recidivism and, and start to break that generational tra- chain that that's so very obvious in our in our prisons. Is that have I, have I got that about right? Is that the yeah. core focus for you? Yeah, I've got I've got two massive frustrations. One is the way the prison system works to make it very difficult for people to leave prison and get a job, and the other is the way society sees people who leave prison and who have other challenges in life. They don't give them that opportunity that they should do. And that's what really, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning and makes me want to do this. And you put your money where your mouth is, of course, because we all know famously Timpsons give hundreds of jobs to ex-prisoners. Uh, but again, a strategy that you believe is good for business, but is also just, just good. There's a lot of risk in that, though, um, James. And I, this is coming across, I'm sure, to anyone. I knew it before because I've had the... I've been lucky enough to meet you a few times prior to us recording this podcast, but anyone listening to this, I'm sure is now picking it, picking it up. You have an infectious optimism, but there's a lot of risk in that as well, isn't there? Because it doesn't always work. It's a, it's a trust based philosophy that you have. And, and on that basis, it doesn't always work. How is it that you, or how do, how do you handle those disappointing moments? And there are, there are disappointing moments. the, I mean, we've had in the early days when I first, I've been doing, I've been recruiting people from prison for 18 years now. And then in the early days, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was making a lot of mistakes. So I was recruiting people who were the wrong kind of people. Um, I was believing their bullshit stories. Um, they weren't ready for it. There was, you know, and, and no one in the business knew what I was doing. And my customers certainly didn't know what I was doing. You know, and I was employing armed robbers and burglars and they were cutting keys for your house when you went into our shop. So, you know, there was, if you talk about trust, there's a lot of trust there. And the, the probably probably the lowest moment was when I recruited a guy in Belfast who had done he hadn't been part of a, a murder but was there at the scene. He got a very long sentence and we took him on when he was released. And when he was working in one of our shops, he served the sister of the man who was murdered. And that made me question lots of things. And then it got in the papers, headline in the Daily Star, and another one was Killer Cobbler Cuts Keys. And you know, the easy thing to do is to you know, dismiss them or whatever. But no, that's so we, you know, we, he still, in fact, he still works for us now, he's doing really well. Um, but the system, you know, society let him down. And I didn't want it to be another person who let him down. But some people from we recruit from prison do let themselves down. But it's far less likely they're going to let themselves down than people we recruit from normal channels. Because the people you recruit from prison, the way we do it, are the most loyal and honest people we have in the business. Um, but when it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. And in the early days, we had a number of cases where it just went horribly wrong. Um, but you, you learn your lessons f- from that. And 
So what I do think, you do? Give me give me a sort of practical, uh, give me a pra- an, an idea of how that applies in, in practical terms. Because how do you how do you protect the business uh, in you know in, in those circumstances? Because it's impossible to know, isn't it? Yeah, it's it is it is trust. I mean, there are a number of ways you can, you can look at it. Which is, you know, when I when I when I sort of came out that we recruited people from prison. Um, there were, there were, you know, um, there were probably been a number of customers that said, I'm never going to one of those shops again because I don't want to be served by someone who's done time. But bizarrely, and this was never the intention, more people now come to us because we recruit people from prison. In fact, a number of customers think that everyone in the business was, was, was recruited from prison. But the, the challenge is around how do you balance that risk of knowing who you're employing from prison and also the risk of knowing of not knowing who you're employing who hasn't been to prison. Because when you recruit someone from prison, you know everything about them. Their CV is all there to see. Just Google their name and put prison in, and it all comes up. And then when, you, when they come for an interview, they have their CV and they have their um, statements and everything they've done to, to talk through why they're now ready for a job. When I, if I was going to recruit anybody from the street to apply to us, I'd never do a background check. I wouldn't know whether they're a paedophile, a sex offender, um, someone who's committed lots of crimes but never been caught. We, and that happens to all of us as, as employers. Um, so I actually feel, bizarrely, recruiting people from prison is less risky than recruiting people who haven't been to prison. What you're, the, the sort of campaign that you're at the forefront of and have been for many years um, is this idea, is around this, this, this kind of conundrum of whether or not uh, uh, we are as a society going to uh, accept that people who come out of prison have a right to work. So w- when I was in prison, uh, as you know, we've talked about this before, James, but I was in an open prison, I was in Belmarsh and then I was in an open prison. And in that open prison, I was working in the education department and I was helping uh, uh, offenders who were who were getting very close to their release dates after very long sentences in, pr- in prison. And I was helping them write their CVs and and doing sort of dragon's den kind of like job presentations fascinating fascinating work but without doubt the key question um amongst that group of individuals is should i be honest about my criminal past or can i find some other way of keeping it buried of 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 maybe changing my name or you know, and of course, if you've if you've been in a, a a a situation that had media coverage, and you really you don't have too much choice because you can do that Google search that you just described. But of course, for the vast majority of people, their sentences actually, or their cases, don't end up in the papers. Might be in a local paper, but the vast majority of don't don't make it to the media. So, you know, there is still this feeling in the prison population that the best way forward is to just pretend it never happened. And of course, the more that that happens, um, the less likely we are to end up having that conversation that you're trying to and do have on almost, I suspect, on a daily basis about the value of, you know, ex-offenders and the contribution that they can make. And much more importantly, uh, that the, the part that all that will play in breaking this generational link between particularly uh, uh, male prisoners, obviously, whose sons then end up in prison because the number of kids who end up in prison, whose dads were in prison, obviously, as you, as you know, is, is depressingly high. So that's, that's the battle that you seem to be wa- waging, is that the public conversation about this has got to change. How optimistic are you um, about that right now? How, how, where do you, how do you feel the momentum is 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 kind of heading in the right direction? Uh, very much so. And although I'm an optimist, when it comes to prisons, I'm a realist. But it is much better news. And whilst COVID has been devastating in so many ways, it's been the best thing that's ever happened to prison recruitment because so many employers are desperate for people. Mm. They are so desperate nowadays that they will even consider recruiting amazing people from prison. So that has been just this tidal wave of employers knocking on prison doors to the extent now that we've actually got more than enough employers who want to employ people in prison. We just haven't got the prisons geared up 
to match the, the, the those leaving prison with the jobs. So, I mean, when I was first doing it, you know, I think it was us, Greg's, um, Halfords, and a couple of other recycling companies, and that was it. Who were prepared to put, you know, their mark their, their, their marker down on this. But now it seems to be that the you know it, the net has spread so far um, that it's sort of become part of every company's diversity strategy. You don't just need to recruit people who come from diverse backgrounds, and you need you need to also consider people from prison because if not, you're not diverse. You just look at the numbers. You're not diverse if you don't if you specifically avoid people who have been to prison. I mean, one of the things I was at a Ministry of Justice meeting today, and one of the things I'm delighted about, even the Ministry of Justice have got 1,100 people with prison experience working full time in the Ministry of Justice, and you know the they they are a better organisation for it. Prisons are sort of crisis laboratories, aren't they? They're very sort of um, emotional places filled with, you know, individual stories of crisis. Uh, Do do, do you agree that sort of the storytelling around prisons needs to sort of change? Um, That we need to... It comes back to what we were discussing earlier with you making the decision to take your 18-year-old daughter, you know, en route to university, uh, where most parents would be thinking, the last thing I want to do on this day of joy, my child's going to Durham, the last thing I'm going to do is go to prison. You decide, no, actually, this is exactly what we're going to do as a family. It's exactly the right thing to do because you're interested in the stories that that are behind, you know, those walls. That's what you're saying, isn't it, is that you want your daughter to understand those stories what more can we do really i suppose um i asked a question if someone is interested in communications what more can we do to try and tell those human stories sort of demystify explain that there's invariably a, a crisis story that sits behind someone being in prison the it's a really good it's a really good point i, I mean it's, it's, it was about two years ago i took geordie Gregg, who was then the editor of the daily mail mm. into brixton prison because it was always, whenever I went to meetings, people say, oh, well, you can't, you know, the MOJ would say, you can't do that because what will the Daily Mail say? So I thought, right, I'll write to the editor of the Daily Mail and say, can I take you into prison so you can see what it's like? And then you can judge whether the th- stories you're writing are right or not. He went, I mean, to, cred- to his credit, he said, yeah, fine. And since, you know, after that visit, I didn't spot any stupid, silly stories in the Daily Mail about prison, you know, lags and all this sort of stuff. Now he's gone, maybe things will change. Um, in fact, if anything, it's the sun is probably the worst culprits on that now. But by giving people the facts, you know, these some of the prison doc, you know, prison documentaries are not helpful at all because they just rely on the drug, drug infested wings with just dysfunctional the remand wings and so on, which is which is in it, it is part of prison life. But it's not a normal part of prison life. Um, but I think the more companies that employ people from prison means that the, the story, certainly from a business world, is changing. And I think then it becomes more normalised. And when things become normal, they're not a story. And we want it to become sort of a bit boring. Oh, you know, everyone else does it, yes. So when it's boring, the media aren't interested in it. But I do think that, you know, I, I can't wait for the first chief executive of a FTSE 100 company to have a criminal record. It would be fantastic. A Premier League football manager who's got a criminal record, fantastic. Because it can prove, you can prove to young people that even if you do have the odd setback in life, it doesn't mean mm. you can't achieve things. Because that's yeah. what we're doing. We're just labelling young people with a, with, with, with a future story that there's no way they can be successful in life if they've messed up. Because most people who go to prison are quite young and they've got a whole life ahead of them. That's right. And we should say, James, because you and I have had this conversation, you know, in, in, different, in different ways at times. So you're not saying that nobody should be in prison. That is not your view, right? If you are violent or if you are a dangerous individual, prisons have their place, right? Your view, as I understand it, is we just put far too many people into prison. It is the wrong answer for far too many people that, that yeah. society, so society surely can come up with a better answer. Yeah, we do two things. Be the door. yeah, we do two things wrong. We send too many people to prison. And we send people to prison for too long. So let me let me let me take the first one. Is the people in the UK are no more naughty than they are in Holland. But Holland sends 20% of the people, the number of people that we do to prison. 
and they have a much lower reoffending rate because people serve their sentence, which is less time anyway, in the community. They have a tag on. Instead of going to prison for three years, they'll, they'll have to do every other weekend for three years. And their summer holiday is spent in prison or it's doing some community work or something like that. And the length of someone's sentence is also um, completely wrong. And there is no evidence anywhere that says sentencing people to longer reduces, reduces their chance of committing more crime in the future. If anything, it increases their likelihood of never being able to have a job, a loving relationship, find a house and become a normal functioning part of society. So, I mean, the average sentence is what, I know, four years, six years for, for, for lots of normal crimes. Well, even, even 10 years ago in the UK, most of these sentences were half or a third of this now. So there are, bizarrely fewer people are going to prison in, in, the, in the country. But the reasons why the prisons are, are just getting fuller and fuller and we're having to build more prisons is people are just there for longer. So people are sitting out their time away from their families, not reading their kids' bedtime stories, and they're just wasting time because it's only really in the last year before they're released that they really focus on employment, uh, getting job ready, and their resettlement. And we need to just people to serve less sentences. If you were, um, you're not interested in politics, but if you did have your hands on the policy levers um, and, you're, and you could do one thing tomorrow, uh, what would it be? What general or to do with justice? To do with justice. Um, okay, the, the easy one, I'd say instead of serving half your sentence to be released, I'd do it as a quarter. How do you think the Daily Mail would react to that? Not very well. Because that dynamic, that kind of, I, I hear what you say about uh, Judy and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the Mal's uh, attitude to your approach. But the media, the media you know, play out, it's not just a tabloid press, by the way. I mean, it's a, it's a, it runs, runs right the way through, right? It's the BBC just, just as much. Yeah. But, then, um, but, our, but, but the, kind of, the kind of media conversation around, around, around prison and around rehabilitation, and I say all this, by the way, as a former tabloid newspaper editor who ran plenty of stories uh, that would, you know, in the context of the conversation we've had, it would have infuriated you. But obviously I've had, a, I've had an interesting experience along the way since. Um, that's part of the problem, though, isn't it? Is that... Is yeah. that dynamic between the politicians and uh, and, and and the media because there are no votes in prison reform no True. and there is and there is no connection between the facts of prison and the impact it has on uh, a prisoner and their families and the, uh, the 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 answers that people give to polling and um, surveys on what people think should happen with crime and sentencing there's no connection. And that's the problem because the, you know, when, um, when manifestos are being developed, the question is, do you think we should be harder on criminals? Yes. Do you think they should go to prison for longer? Yes. Well, if I said to them, um, let me show you the evidence. that If we actually sent them to prison for less time, they'd be less likely to commit offence in the future. Do you think that's a good idea? Yes. So there's two ways of going about it, but we should be dealing with the facts, not just emotion. Very good. James, thank you so much for this conversation. Really interesting, really helpful um, from so many different angles as well. And thank you for the work that you're doing, because I think it's um, I think it's it's absolutely um, it's absolutely critical. Um, I want to finish, though, by asking you for your crisis cures. These are three things um, uh, other than another person, please, uh, that you've kind of relied on during those uh, those difficult moments in your life. Um, probably give you, I don't know whether they're very good ones, but they work for me. First one is breathing, um, learning how to breathe. A lot of us don't know how to breathe, so I try hard. I'm not brilliant at it, but I try hard to breathe, to be calm, to be thoughtful. Um, so you meditate? Is that, what you, is that part so of it? I, I, my, my mind's too busy to, to meditate, so I just try the breathing bit. That's sort of half works for me, but I, right. that, that's the next step. The next one is just physical exercise, and we're a Peloton family, so half yeah. an hour, 45 minutes on that, beating myself um, to try and hit, you know, hit some sort of ridiculous target. That's what I try and do, because I always feel better after that and completely forget about it. And the other is probably a combination of um, car rallies. So I know nothing about cars, but I love Bristol cars. So I've right. gone car rallies with the kids um, or music festivals. When, when, when you're dancing or you're in an old car, 
nothing seems to worry you. Splendid. Uh, James, thanks so much for joining us. As I say, a very valuable conversation and thank you for it. Cheers. Thanks, Andy. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do give us a rating and a review. It really helps. And if you hit subscribe, wherever you download your podcast from, you'll find loads more useful crisis conversations. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Our handle is at Crisis What Crisis Podcast. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>